This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. It gives me great pleasure to have my colleague Dr. Mark Kliss with us today. Um, you remember that when Dr. Cohn came last week, people kept asking questions about, you know, how, what do you eat in space and what do you do about the waste and stuff, and he kept saying, Mark Quist will answer all. So we have Mark here to answer everything you wanted to know about controlled environmental life support. So if you think about it, when we're on Earth, we've got, you know, plenty of oxygen to breathe. We're up at about 20.9% um, in the atmosphere at sea level. And we have a reasonably nice temperature. If you go to Stanford, you have a very nice temperature most of the year. Um, you know, you flush the toilet, you don't think much of it. The food shows up in the cafeteria somehow, and the garbage is taken out somehow and so on. Well, you don't have all that sort of somehow happening in space. If you're away from Mother Earth, somehow there is nothing too trivial to have to start worrying about. Remember Dr. Cohn talked about even questions of you know, go to the end of the corridor and turn left. It doesn't mean anything if one person is upside down relative to the other person. So, um, you all set? Sure. So, Mark, who has been involved in this for many years, is going to tell everything. And I know there are many questions, probably more than we've had any other lecture. And I am sure that he would be happy to answer any of them. Please, feel free. This is a great opportunity to ask Mark. So, off we go. Okay, well, uh, thanks so much for the intro. Uh, as Lynn mentioned, I'm, I'm Mark Kliss. I'm Chief of Bioengineering Branch at NASA Ames. Uh, brief background on me. Uh, I got my uh, aerospace engineering degree from the University of Colorado, bioengineering degree from the University of Colorado, all my degrees from the University of Colorado. I was a slow learner. Um, but I did get some skiing in, so that was all. Uh, and I've been at NASA working on the life support systems that we need for, for future missions uh, beyond low Earth orbit. And the kind of things that, that I'll tell you about in a minute uh, is kind of a combination of biology, chemistry, engineering, physics, uh, some of the others. Uh, maybe you can give me a brief idea on your backgrounds, mostly biology. Chemistry. Uh, we have a lot of human biology, human biology, biology physiology, um, a little bit, and then we have the engineering side. Okay, so engineers so also, mix. astronomers, anyone? Okay, uh, good. So what I'm going to do is it's going to kind of be three main parts. Uh, the first part I'll give you a, a rather quick history of what we <coughs> use for life support systems, uh, kind of the Gemini Mercury Apollo programs. Uh, then there'll be the second part of what are we doing now with the shuttle and the space station. What are their limitations? Why do we need new systems? Uh, and then I'll tell you the third part is going to kind of be what we're trying to do for the future and where we're heading there, uh, which will include some of the biology. So this is just a little aerial shot of, of where we work. I mean, it's NASA Ames Research Center just down the road there on 101. Uh, but before I talk about the life support systems uh, that are, we're going to use to, to send people off for human exploration, why do we want to send humans off? Okay, well, that pretty well wraps up my presentation. Uh, no they've good been, reason, so... Uh, they've been brainwashed for the last two months, so this is your chance. <laughs> I mean, seriously, why, why do we want to send you and beyond lower order? Yeah. Because they're someday in the very far future, might not be as habitable, and might need to go to That's a, a possible one. Which which presentations have they heard? Is Chris McKay and Mal talked to you? Or? Chris is not. Okay. Next week. Okay, yeah, I mean, there, there may be some things. This is astrobiology. Any other astrobiology kind of questions that might come up? Yes? Uh, in one day, an astronaut can be more experienced than the world. Yeah, there, there's a couple of different reasons. And you go, there's that, that human element that goes, yeah, whether people believe it or not, we're, we're somewhat capable and more capable than a lot of the robotic systems, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. When it's the new novel thinking part of it, uh, we can see good. And then there's that other part that you go, well, what if there were a planet, I'm not saying it's Mars, but some planet, uh, maybe some of the ones that we, we just heard about here, uh, that was used to be warmer, wetter, uh, more Earth-like than it currently is. Uh, what if it lost most of its atmosphere? Uh, 
what if the atmosphere that's left is almost entirely carbon dioxide and, and not very much oxygen or anything else? Um, would that be interesting to understand what happened to that planet? It maybe had the capacity to support life at some point, now it doesn't. Anything we care about? Anything we're doing lately that we might want to use as an analogy? Okay, so yeah, it, it, it's kind of saying we, we might want to understand what happens on, on that kind of a planetary system basis uh, to say maybe it's applicable to Earth. Uh, maybe we can get a little bit of insight uh, into some of our own problems here and issues. And then that other one where we go kind of the bigger question, uh, the, the really big question, is you go, well, did living organisms ever exist anywhere else besides on Earth? Uh, that's one of those questions that I, I think is, is the, the big one in astrobiology, where you go, is there a threat of life beyond, in the universe beyond here? Uh, if there is, I, I would suggest that our, our, our understanding of the universe would be pretty profoundly altered. Uh, there, there's huge implications that would go well beyond NASA and science and all the rest for, for what that might mean to us. So those are the kind of things that you say, yes, people are good at it, and yes, there's a need, if we can keep them up there long enough, far enough away from home, that we have a chance at answering some of those kinds of things. So here's the, the quick history part, uh, just so you all kind of know, this is, this is what we've done so far. Uh, and then you say, why do we need any new life support systems? This was Project Mercury, uh, and this was about 1958. And this was a very straightforward, simple mission. It was to send a man into space and, and return him safely. Uh, didn't matter how long, just get him up there, see if he can survive in the space environment, uh, bring him back safely. Uh, this was right after Sputnik, uh, the whole Russian or Soviet program at the time. Uh, it was kind of on a hurry-up basis. Uh, we didn't have a well-thought-out medical basis for, for life support, for keeping humans alive in space, so we borrowed off of whatever we knew about which was essentially high-altitude weather balloons and high-altitude aircraft. Uh, so we use those systems as best we can. You can kind of see them a little bit uh, there. He's, he's sitting on them in the back. You can see in this little capsule there's an environmental control system that literally is kind of his chair. Uh, this kind of a system, it, it was simply his air and his water and a little bit of food. Uh, at the time, with, with Mercury program, they had flown inanimate objects, both the Russians and the Americans. Uh, they had flown dogs, they had flown monkeys, uh, and they kind of said, well, the, well, some of the astronauts, good nature, would say, uh, the next logical step in this evolution was to fly John Glenn, sort of like he's somewhere in between there. Uh, and that was what they used with this whole suborbital approach, uh, saying, borrow whatever we have from high altitude aircraft and balloons. And they demonstrated that. They kept him up there for about 34 hours. Very successful. Worked just fine. Uh, that was the Gemini program. Sorry, that was the Mercury program. Then came the Gemini program. Here it was the next step along that line. They were already thinking about, can we go to the moon? Uh, do we have everything we need for a successful moon venture? And the next part after, yeah, we can keep people alive in the space environment, is can they do anything there? Like get outside of the spacecraft, walk around on the moon. So that was when we started having the ability to get outside of the spacecraft and the life support systems associated with it. And then also kind of say, can you do it for longer durations? Uh, the Gemini program, they kept two people uh, up for about 14 days. And again, the life support approach was kind of this bring everything along, sit on it under your chair, your air and your water, a little bit of food, and mostly pressure and thermal control. Uh, the other thing to point out is you go, imagine the first folks who are doing this, and you're sitting in this capsule, which really isn't much bigger than a phone booth, for two weeks. And everything that's keeping you alive, you're sitting on it, like in your chair right now. Then came the Apollo program. Uh, this one you're probably all familiar with. Again, another straightforward goal. This was land someone on the moon, return them safely. Not just get them in space, not just get them outside the capsule, but let them walk around on the moon and then bring them back. And again, we use the expendable supplies for, for life support approach. So you're, you're seeing a trend here. You've got pretty short mission durations, less than a week or two. Small crew sizes, a couple of three or four people. You're not very far from home. It's kind of like backpacking. You bring everything along that you need. 
carry it on your back or stick it under your seat and come home before you run out, preferably in that order. Um, and that's the approach that was used uh, through our whole space program to Apollo. Practical, successful, worked every time, never lost anyone. There's a cost to it, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, so that really was our whole philosophy, and, and still kind of is. It's, it's expendable supplies, resources that you can bring up, uh, use without worrying about replenishing, and making sure that you get them before you run out of them. That was kind of the way, the philosophy, we re reviewed all of our natural resources uh, at, at that time in, in our country and others. And kind of the change in, in that thinking and philosophy is something that also relates back into life support as we're thinking of these new systems. And maybe that's not the best way to do this for the long term and the long haul. Okay, then came Skylab. Uh, this is about 1972, 1973. And here was for the first time an opportunity to really get into some of the long duration aspects of, of humans in space. Uh, I don't know if Mal mentioned any of that, but there's a lot of medical uh, tests being done, physiology, cardiovascular systems, uh, changes in, in blood systems, bone density. Uh, they had guys exercising on bicycles and treadmills to see if there was any change in, in deterioration of performance. Um, of course, when you do all of that, you get a little bit sweaty, so they put them in the shower. This was actually a shower they brought up, human shower, it's kind of like a dishwasher that you get in, and you can see the lid that closes on top of you there. Um, you can see up top there, oh no, I have to go to a different color. Um, at the top there, uh, that was the, the top view down of the whole Skylab uh, module. They were very large because it had the Saturn rocket that could accommodate during the large masses. And for the first time in life support, they said, why don't we try a regenerable system? Why don't we take that carbon dioxide that these guys are, are producing as they're exercising and doing all the medical aspects and convert it back into oxygen? And the sole reason they did that was because the device that could convert carbon dioxide back into oxygen weighed about 35 pounds, whereas the amount of oxygen they would have had to bring up in this resupply mode <coughs> weighed about 1,200 pounds. So they said, well, we got over 1,100 pounds of other stuff we can bring up, like these exercise machines and the, the human dishwasher and all the rest of it that went out there. So it's simply payload mass. It said this is a good thing to do. Now, it took a lot more power, but we had these really big solar arrays on, on Skylab, that we had plenty of power. So it was a very good trade, and that's kind of the way these trades keep going. Now we get to the shuttle program, a little more current. Uh, so we've already kind of started moving away from this expendable supplies and we're starting to do some regeneration on Skylab and what do you think we have on the space shuttle? We have a whole bunch of regenerable technologies where we're recycling all that stuff, recovering it, making it more and more efficient. Take a guess. No. Why not? You're absolutely right. Uh, we went backwards. We went back to the Apollo program. Uh, why? Because the space shuttle only goes up for seven days, two weeks nominally. It's got a small crew size, six, seven <coughs> people. It's not very far from home. It only needs to get up to low Earth orbit. We already have a practical, successful approach for that, right? That's the backpack. Bring it all along and use it up. So it's really, even though this was the new vehicle, the replacement for the Saturn rocket, the next generation, seemed like an exciting vehicle from life support perspective. The air that they have up there is brought up in tanks, oxygen and nitrogen. Uh, they, they do sometimes combine a little bit uh, of CO2 removal uh, with an amine bed system uh, that pulls it out. They've demonstrated that once, but for the most part it's expendables. Uh, all your water is brought up uh, because the shuttle needs power. Uh, they have fuel cells which combine hydrogen and oxygen that's brought up. It's mostly to produce electricity and power a lot of the internal electronics in there. But the byproduct of electrolysis, of course, combining hydrogen and oxygen, is water in addition to the electricity you get. So they go, well, that's a freebie. We get the water anyway, so they use it. Uh, so there's a little bit of that, but it still starts from stored stuff, hydrogen and oxygen. All your food is stored. Uh, any of your waste products, your liquid wastes, uh, they're either vented or, or stored. Uh, some of them that are vented, of course, they immediately freeze and crystallize, kind of like the little nano diamonds that when 
folks look out the windows, they, they see this little glow of, of frozen particles around the vehicle sometimes. And then your solid wastes uh, are exposed to vacuum uh, to kind of remove some of the water from them and then also stored for return. So it really is still all store and resupply. But what we've talked a little bit about is saying we want to get out of that, that low Earth orbit part. Uh, that very thin little line, and that's about where shuttle and space station and everything else would be. And we want to start thinking about going further away for longer time periods uh, where you don't have that easy option to come back home when you run out. Uh, the question is, can we use the same life support approach that we've used up to date? How far away uh, has all of our human spaceflight experience been, except for the Apollo program? How far is the shuttle and the station and all that other stuff that it's currently up there? Mir, you can include that too. Take a guess. Do you want to look at distance? Yeah. Pick a number, make something up. Five miles. Five miles. You're close. A little bit more. Eight miles. How many? Eight. Eight. Okay, now you got to keep going a little more than that. About 200 miles, 200, 200, <laughs> but not all that far. I, what I tell folks sometimes as you go, if, if, if you could get in a car and drive straight up at 60 miles an hour, you'd be there before you could get to Tahoe. That's how far away we are in, in all of our spaceflight experiences. So not that far. How far away is the moon? Okay, that one I'll make up. Uh, 250,000 miles. How far away is Mars? Oh, okay. In that case, that will be on the quiz. Uh, it's about 50 million miles. And, and it's actually a little bit worse. Uh, as you go, if, uh, in terms of mean distance from the sun, which, which is one way you, you talk about <coughs> interstellar space. Uh, if, if the sun are somewhere way over here, the Earth is, is somewhere about 93 million miles away from the sun. Now Mars is about 143 million miles away from the sun. So 50 million miles further away mean distance from the sun. But it's worse than that because you can't just go straight there. You, you have to kind of get these planets to line up and they're all spinning around the sun. Uh, we'll get to the Copernicus quiz in a moment. Um, do we really all spin around the sun? No? We're the center of the universe, right? Earth is where it's at. We're it. Right? Okay, well, that, that's another one from astrobiology that, that I'll toss out right now. As you say, there, there was this weird guy, Copernicus, I think he was Polish. I'm Polish, so I can say that. Uh, but, but somewhere I had this idea that says maybe we're not the, the, the geometric center of the universe, right? He said the sun was. Well, he wasn't widely liked by people at his time, particularly the churches. Uh, kind of went against their philosophy, but it turned out he was right. Well, what astrobiology might be asking is maybe we're not the biologic center of the universe either. Just a thought. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we're looking at. So we're trying to get to there to find out, are we in fact the biologic center of the universe, or is there some other places it might be? And to get there, you say you have to have a path, and you wait until these planets line up, and you try and get the shortest distance going to it, and preferably even a shorter distance coming back. Because to get all those planets to line up, you have to stay on Mars about 600 days. If you want to come home earlier, you can, but Every day you're shorter on the stay, it ends up meaning your return is that much longer. And being in transit in a microgravity environment is not where you want to spend most of your time. You want it in the gravity environment, the radiation shielding, all the other things. You know, that's the safest way to do that mission. So they say, what, these are what are called thousand day class missions, where they go, it's, it's three months out, three months back, and, and two years on the surface to be able to make the whole thing work. So here's where the life support question comes up. Everything we've done so far says we know exactly how to do this very practically and successfully, as long as it's not more than a couple of weeks and three days away from home. 
some of the astronauts, another University of Colorado graduate, uh, was quoted uh, as saying, going up in the space shuttle is a lot like going camping in a Winnebago, except the doors are mostly locked from the outside. And when she said, you know, when we think about what do we bring up on the shuttle, it's for a two-week <coughs> stay. And you go, what do you think that you're going to bring along for a two-year stay? It would probably be very different things. And if you try and imagine when you say, well, you're, you're not just going visiting something for a couple of weeks, you're going to go live there for a couple of years. Same question as, what does this do for our life support system? So we have the same approach that we use, kind of same philosophy that we use really work. And here's the part where I said there was a cost. This, this practical, successful part, you can do it, but there's some costs associated with it. And you go, here's the basic needs uh, of a person, average person. Uh, this is adapted from the International Space Station, but these are still roughly applicable. Uh, you need about a kilogram of oxygen, you need about half a kilogram of, of dried food, that's, that's dehydrated, the solids. And then you need about three and a half liters of water that's either contained in your food, that's used to, to rehydrate the food, or drinking water, that kind of thing. So round numbers, five <coughs> kilograms per person per day for the bare essentials, your air, food, and water. Uh, that's for pretty spartan conditions, right? Then there's that other part, the launch cost to orbit. How much does it cost to send a kilogram of stuff up into space on a space shuttle? Anyone have an idea? Take another guess. Five miles isn't going to work this time. Dollars. Thousand dollars? Ten thousand dollars. Pretty good round number, and that's a conservative number. They don't factor everything in. But ten thousand dollars a kilogram is, is your rough launch cost to lower the orbit. That's using this shuttle version. So 50,000 bucks per person per day for your air, food, and water. Sound like a pretty good deal? I travel a lot, and believe me, we don't get that pretty on NASA. Uh, no, <laughs> we really don't. Uh, then there's another part that's not factoring in. You say beyond the basics, well, there's some other kinds of hygiene functions that say if you're going to have more than a couple of people there for more than a couple of weeks, it would be nice if, um, well, you had some hand wash, face wash water, clothes wash, dish wash, toilet flush, that kind of thing. Uh, that's another one. Half a kilogram of water to flush a toilet. Do you think that toilet really exists here on Earth? We're talking about a gallon and a half or 1.6 gallon toilets and saying that's low flow. Uh, well, that's low flow. Uh, so we have those kind of systems. When you add this part up, and you can be conservative again, but it, it's at least another 10 kilograms per person, 10 to 20 kilograms per person for those kind of hygiene functions. <coughs> you say you're, you're talking another 100,000 to $250,000 per person per day for their basic life support consumables, the stuff you use up and throw away and, and don't think about, right, because it's a cheap, easy mission to do. <coughs> So if you had a crew of six that's trying to go to Mars on a two and a half year mission, how much does all that add up to? Say a million dollars. Billion dollars. Billion dollars. He's absolutely right. Uh, well, we all kind of go, yeah, a billion here, a billion there. Um, you know, so what? To put it in a little more perspective, uh, unfortunately, no drinking a small drink, but uh, sort of like that one in the back there. How much would a Coke or a Pepsi cost to get into space? Just a can of anything. <coughs> Roughly. Why'd you say that? Because it's pretty close. I mean, if, if you actually look at the can, and, and you'll see that it's either in fluid ounces or it comes out to about 330 milliliters, which is about a third of a kilogram. So it's about a third of ten thousand dollars. So it's about three three thousand dollars for anything you want to drink that much of it. Does that sound like a good deal to you? No. That's what we're currently paying, and it doesn't matter whether it's water, Coke, Pepsi. You might as well bring up the most expensive champagne you can find. <laughs> it's still cheap in comparison to what you're going to have up there for your lunch price. So that's the, the dollar value cost. And then the other side that we talked about a little bit was the mission capability cost. 
every kilogram of stuff that, that's life support consumables means there's one less kilogram of other things you could have otherwise brought up. There's only so much payload that you can bring up on any, on any launch vehicle. So it trades directly with other capabilities like science instrumentation and, and other things you want to actually do some exploring with. And there's a point where you say if, if you use this approach and it's all expendables resupply, you say, well, you can't go very far for very long, or if you do, all you're pretty much doing is sitting around and, and eating and breathing and, and just barely staying alive. And that was kind of what we called the, the flags and footprints missions when we went to the moon. Uh, most of our payload was consumed with keeping getting them there and keeping those folks alive. So we didn't do much else except plant the flag and walk around a little bit. That was our capability that we had. So the lessons learned from all of this is we say the expendables approach is very practical. It works, but it only works for short durations, close to home, with a small crew size. Anything beyond there, you start saying, can we recycle it? Can we regenerate it? Can we start doing something else with it? Can we get those costs down? And that's pretty much what we use for the, for the space station. Uh, and when we think about that, and this is what I'll start going through briefly, is we go, if we could regenerate more of those consumables, particularly the water, because you remember the water is, is the big chunk of all the mass here that, that we're throwing away. If we could do that, uh, we'd start making a lot of progress. And that's essentially the approach we're taking on station. We're just not there yet. So what are the approaches that we use? And this is now where we kind of say, this is the second part of the talk, where we say station and, and shuttle existing systems. We say we're trying to close these air and water loops, recover as much as we can. And there's three main parts to, to closing the, the water loop. There's the potable water, the stuff you drink, the hygiene water, which is the, the hygiene functions, and then there's recovery of water from the urine. And we go, one of the questions that I ask is a couple of years ago when there was the Columbia accident, uh, one of the first phone calls that I got early on a Saturday morning was asking me how much water is left. And you go, the reason they asked that immediately was because they knew up on space station that crew is burning down water at a certain rate, right? They're consuming it at that three liters, three kilograms per person per day roughly. They knew how much they had up there. And they said, we're not likely to have a shuttle going up for quite a while. <coughs> But we have progress modules. We have the Russian versions that can still make it to the space station. They just can't bring as much up as the shuttle can because they're smaller and much less payload capacity. So it's kind of the sawtooth function that says, crew is burning it down at this rate. Something below that line is, is a risk to crew health and safety. Progress modules bring up a little bit, so it'll bump it up, but then it's burning it down again, bumping it up, burning it down, bumping it up, burning it down. When do we have a problem? And the answer was in about six months. And sometime in about August, six months later, we went from three crew to two crew up on the International Space Station. And the sole reason was they had a choice of either say, bring back everyone because we don't have enough water, figure out a way to get more water up there, and there wasn't any because progress already had to bring everything else up that was planned, or reduce your crew size. And that's what they did. Uh, they took one person off. So that's how important and how thin a margin we have on these life support systems when you get into a contingency or something that you're not expecting. So we'll do a little bit of the chemistry. That's for all the chemistry majors here, uh, mostly in the water processing. We'll get to the biology shortly. You can see there's a bunch of different candidate technologies that you can use for, for recovering this kind of water. Uh, doesn't matter the names that much on them. The ones that are in italics and red are what we currently have used on the International Space Station. Uh, and what you notice is you say, well, there's multifiltration, RO, electrodeionization that can do potable water. There's reverse osmosis that can do hygiene. There's thermoelectric integrated membrane evaporation, a bunch of other names that can do urine. Kind of individual processors do individual functions. Uh, that's kind of the approach in, that we're currently using here. So for that first part, that potable water, what do we do with that? How do we recover potable water? Well, as you breathe, you're, you're exhaling uh, water vapor. And also, as you're doing your daily functions, you're perspiring a little bit through your skin. You're releasing water vapor. And on orbit, uh, they recover that water vapor with a temperature and humidity control system, and they condense it. So you go from vapor to a liquid again. So it goes through a phase change. 
And then you have these multi-filtration beds that kind of look like a very large version of what you might have under your sink at home. It's not os reverse osmosis, but it's still a multi-filtration bed. Uh, and it essentially purifies the water back into potable steam. Uh, now these beds need a lot of replacing, uh, and it only produces a fraction of that potable water because the amount that you're exhaling doesn't near equal what you're taking in in drinking water. Most of it ends up as urine. Then there's a second part to regenerating the potable water. You say, okay, so we're, we're way short. What can we do now? Well, there's a system called a Sabatier reactor. We don't have it up on orbit yet, but we hopefully will by this summer or fall. Uh, and as you breathe, you also exhale carbon dioxide, right? And what that Sabatier reactor does is takes carbon dioxide, and in the presence of hydrogen and a lot of heat, it'll produce water, and methane is a byproduct. So you say, when, when that becomes functional and operational on station, we're actually going to get a lot of the potable water that we're going to be recovering <coughs> from the carbon dioxide that the astronauts are exhaling. Note again, this is a phase change. We're taking a gas and we're converting it back into a liquid, right? <coughs> now the only problem is there, you guys have all noticed, if you say, so where the heck did that hydrogen come from? Because most of the time we really don't want to be bringing up pure hydrogen in pressurized tanks, as Mr. Hindenburg uh, showed there's a, an issue with that. Then we get to the second part, the hygiene water. Uh, this is not the potable, that's for those functions. And we say this is for your hand wash, face wash, clothes, shower, all of those kind of things. Again, we picked this multi-filtration technology. Uh, it's not the best one for it, because as you would imagine with hygiene water, you get soap, you get hair, you get skin cells, you get everything else from the hygiene functions that are going to clog up these filtration beds, and they do. Uh, but that was the best that we had at the time. Uh, we said they, they try and pre-filter it a little bit, but they exchange out those entire beds about every 15 days when they have a full group of three people. Uh, so there's a lot of consumables. They still recover the water, but there's still a lot of consumables associated with it. And then the last part to the water loop, the third part, how do you recover water from urine? Uh, well, the, the part that you drink that you either don't perspire uh, or, or exhale uh, becomes part of your urine stream. And the way we do that, we can regenerate it back into hygiene water. Now, washing with your own <coughs> urine probably doesn't sound real <coughs> hygienic, but if you look at the process here, uh, it's pretreated, uh, it's evaporated, so there's one phase change process, it's then compressed and condensed, so there's a second phase change process. Uh, you're probably starting to say this sounds a lot like making beer or beer in reverse. Uh, there's some more processes in there where it's finally uh, post-treatment, polished, cleaned up. Uh, but it only gets to hygiene quality. It's not potable. So we say, no, what started as potable when you drank it now becomes your urine. The best it ever becomes again is hygiene water. So we're starting to see there's a little bookkeeping accounting problem here in our, in our whole scheme. Uh, this is a shot of, of my boss, uh, Carl Waltz, uh, when he was up on the International Space <laughs> Station. And what do you think these guys are? Toilets. Toilets. Pretty close. Uh, there were water tanks. If anyone had lived on a farm, you'd go, they look a lot like milk canisters when you're milking the cows. You probably don't do that a lot, but I'm familiar with it anyway. Uh, and that's what they are, is they say the Russians essentially adapted things from their dairy industry and said, well, we can bring up water in the progress modules in those canisters. And then when they're empty, they become essentially the toilets. They fill them back up with urine. And they store them, you know how they're stored, uh, until the next progress module comes up so they can now load them up in there and, and burn them up on reentry again. <coughs> You start noticing that you go, well, here's, here's our whole space station. This is on the way out to the progress modules, but you go, at some point, they, they're kind of in the way. Uh, so, so this isn't a small problem. You say it's off in the corner, we don't worry about it. Uh, it's a significant issue that they're dealing with. This is the system that's going to try and solve that problem. Uh, it's, it's about the size of two large refrigerators, one, one here and one there. And that's the water recovery system. You can kind of see those multi-filtration beds that were in there that we showed you before. Those are the ones that keep getting changed out. 
all these other large circular things. Those are kind of the distillation processors that do those phase changes and a bunch of other stuff that you say, well, that's how you can actually get your hygiene water, your potable water, uh, recovery of some of the water from your urine back to hygiene water uh, with that kind of a system. <coughs> okay, then we get to the next part. That's the water loop. Then we say, okay, what can we do about the air loop in the, in the spacecraft? Mark, you want to take about a two-minute break at this point before we get to air? Sure. Is that okay? You can take a water break. <laughs> um, okay, we're all back. Uh, this is the part where we said uh, air loop. How do we close that? What technologies can we use to kind of start regenerating the air uh, that we're consuming up there? Just like the water system, there's three parts to it. The first one is, is just generating the oxygen that they need. Again, a bunch of different kinds of technologies that can do that. The second part, we're going to remove the CO2 that we're exhaling that would otherwise build up to a high concentration. A whole bunch of technologies that can do that. And then the third part, which is CO2 reduction, meaning not make it teeny-weeny, but chemically reduce it, turn it back into something else useful. But also notice that it was in the, the water loop too, that one thing that goes, well, there's one technology called bioregeneration that looks like it can do all of those things. In fact, in the water loop, it could do most of the water functions as well. And, and keep that in mind as, as we go through this, because uh, there's other options that we can use. These are the ones that we're just basing on our own criteria for selection right now. So we say to do the oxygen loop, uh, how do we do that? Uh, we say it's, it's the way we currently do it. Uh, remember I said each one of these technologies is kind of well suited for one function. Well, in some cases that works just fine. If you want to take hygiene water and convert it back into hygiene water, a filter is probably a good way to go, right? You can change it out, they don't weigh very much, they're not that big. Uh, but then there's some other functions that get a little bit more complex when we start thinking about really closing these loops. And here's where we get a little biology, for example. That CO2 that we're exhaling, where does the, the C in the CO2 come from, do you think? Sugar. Sugar. So essentially the food we eat, right? Where does the O2 and CO2 come from? Water we drink. So you go, our human metabolism, the food and the water that we drink, the, the byproduct, the waste product, is, is CO2. So we're taking a solid and a liquid, turning it into a gas. What's the likelihood we can take that gas and turn it back into a solid? We know we can turn it back into a liquid, right? That was already up there. So you go, there's always going to be problems with that kind of conversion unless we can start thinking of some other approaches. So for the oxygen loop, we say, well, there's, there's a technology called static feed water electrolysis, and it's kind of just the opposite of the shuttle fuel cells. Uh, you just say it takes uh, water. Remember that extra hygiene water that we said we were producing because we took urine, got to hygiene, but we can't do anything more with it. We don't need that much more hygiene water because we're always losing potable water. That hygiene water is what they electrolyze and turn back into oxygen and hydrogen. Some of that hydrogen, if you remember that other equation where I said, yes, CO2 and in the presence of hydrogen, the spot A reactor can convert it into water. Where did the hydrogen come from? Static feed water electrolysis system. That's, that's taking out those extra hydrogens and getting it there. So we're starting to close it. We're starting to see where all this goes, but we're still a little ways away. Note again that we said in the water loop, we use gases, right? When we have water vapor and carbon dioxide, we we're producing the pure water that we want, those phase changes. Now we're in the air loop. How do we get pure oxygen? We electrolyze water. We go through another phase change. That's always what's in the physical chemical world perceived as the purest products that we can get. Okay, uh, here's my boss again. Notice how he makes me insert him a lot in these presentations. Uh, with the Russian oxygen generation system. Uh, another little incidental note is, is their architecture is different than ours. If you look at their spacecraft, if you look at any of their systems, uh, they tend to use spheres and cylinders a lot. We tend to use cubes and, and other things a lot. And, you know, people ask, well, is it because of the surface to volume ratio and all the other things? And it seems like they, they think it looks a little bit better, too. Uh, so this is the, uh, the Russian system that does generate oxygen. It's had a lot of problems. Uh, one of them, notably, is it catches fire 
Um, so <laughs> it sort of obviates the whole point of producing oxygen. Um, here's the American system, the U.S. system that they're going to try and uh, put on board. This went up last fall. Uh, it also has problems. Uh, it runs intermittently, which is almost as bad as catching fire, uh, at least if you're up there. Uh, so they're trying to solve those problems as well. They say this is still an issue that we're trying to deal with. Uh, so stay tuned. That's part of what we do in the labs at Mass Ames is figure out a way to improve those systems. Then we get to the second part, the CO2 removal. Uh, so we had oxygen generation. Now we're saying we're trying to remove that CO2. Uh, here again, we have a system, it's called a four-bed molecular sieve. doesn't matter that much where it is, that's kind of what it looks like. It's just simply a couple of beds to say they trap the carbon dioxide in one bed, and then when it's full, they heat and desorb it, and that dumps the CO2 back out into space, and they keep just switching between those two beds. As one is desorbing, the other one is absorbing, and then when it gets full and saturated, they switch it, and the other one that's empty now, they keep purging and cycling like that. And then you recall the last part, the Sabatier uh, reactor uh, does that last part that says once you've captured the CO2 and you're desorbing it off those beds, you can now run it into that reactor, which now converts it back into water or oxygen. So here's just a brief schematic, abbreviated schematic of the space station and all the life support equipment in there. And you can kind of see the, the green stuff is where most of the gases that you need, and, and they're all over place and the blue stuff is cleverly color coordinated for all the liquids and the water that you need. Uh, it's all over the place. The purple stuff is for nitrogen storage, other stored gases, uh, and then the red part is for all of your HVAC, ventilation, circulation, those kind of things. The point here is that you go, there's at least one, two, three, four, five, well, practically all of the space station except the Japanese module and the European module that are full of life support stuff. That's where a big chunk of our mass goes to. And then this is just a quick summary kind of of our strategy of how we're starting to regenerate the air and the water. And we'll kind of just go through it and you can do the mass balance in your head. And keep in mind we don't do all of this yet, but this is what we're trying to get to when we have that Sabatier reactor up there. And this is the kind of thing that we say we're trying to improve on a little bit as we think about those long duration missions, either for moon bases, going to Mars, that kind of thing. So we start with the, the air that we have in the tanks, right? Uh, you exhale your CO2, uh, you collect it in this four bed molecular sieve, uh, you reduce it in the Sabatier reactor, uh, creating both water and methane, those are your byproducts there. But to be able to do that, you have to add hygiene from that static feed water electrolysis system. And to do that, it needs hygiene water and nitrogen, which also now produces the oxygen that you're actually breathing. So you say the oxygen that you have is actually coming from your hygiene water. But the hygiene water, you remember, actually comes from your urine, right? But the urine comes from your potable water. And the potable water comes from the CO2 that you're exhaling that goes into the Sabatier reactor that now gets the hygiene and the hydrogen from the static feed water electrolysis, which is really your hygiene system. Does that all make perfect sense? Good, that will also be the main quiz question. You have that all <laughs> down. Uh, is it likely you're gonna end up with shortages or surpluses with that kind of approach? Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's good, it's heading in the right direction, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So, uh, so that's what we're trying to do. We say that, that covers the air and the water loops to the extent that we can right now. But keep in mind as we're thinking of these future missions, uh, it didn't deal with any of those filters, with any of the catalysts, with any of the other resupply things that you need to have there. Uh, it didn't do any solid food recovery. Uh, no waste processing, remember those, those tanks. Uh, no nitrogen recovery. Uh, and we haven't talked about food at all. Uh, so I'll do that just very briefly. Uh, this is a, an older slide from the shuttle. Uh, Food on the shuttle was what they called thermostabilized. It's essentially the freeze-dried uh, little packs, a lot like backpacking. Uh, here's a, a shuttle tray. Uh, you can kind of see that if, if you know, it's it's great for a couple of weeks. Uh, but again, if you started asking people who had eaten it for a couple of weeks, if there's anything they'd like to see improve, um, texture, um, freshness, possibly color. Uh, 
uh, are the kind of things that, that come up that are identified as, as lacking. Uh, space Station also has this kind of thermal stabilized food, but they also have some frozen and some fresh. Uh, the Russians have always brought up fruits and, and things that didn't perish very quickly. Uh, and so we also have that on station, but it's all resupplied. It's, it's on the shuttle, it's every well, 90 days if you have one that's flying. Uh, and on progress, it's a little bit more infrequent, but it's less than outside of the And then, if you noticed all this packaging, the part that you don't eat becomes trash. And you can't just throw it out. Well, why can't you just throw it out? Okay, you could throw it out, right? Except you're in orbit. You're going pretty damn <coughs> fast. And about every, well, hour and a half, 90 minutes, you're right back where you started. So if you throw it out, that trash is right there in your windshield, except going really, really fast. So you say it's a piece of debris, just like any other space debris, if you just dumped it in the orbit you were in. So you go, you need to do something else with it. Well, you either save it and bring it back with you, or you give it a big enough of a push that it's no longer in your orbit. Well, the saving it, so you can bring it back. Remember, it's $10,000 a kilogram, just like everything else you brought up here. It's really expensive trash. Uh, what, what this guy has right there is probably 20,000 bucks worth of plastic and, and uneaten food. Um, the other version, where you say, well, you can burn it up by attaching a kick motor or something that gets it out of your orbit, makes it even more expensive. So you go, the trash part is something else we have to deal with. I don't know if you can see this. This is this is the station version again. This is not my boss. He didn't want to be in that picture for some reason. But there's a guy in here, and you go, all of these bags and containers, they brought up valuable, useful stuff to the station. And what they become are the trash bags. And they get stored like this until there's something that can take them away. And you can see this is kind of an entire module that goes out the picture there. This is, again, not a small problem. Uh, over 90 days, actually, if you try this at home, uh, don't throw out your trash for three months, you'll be amazed how much you collect. Uh, <coughs> when it has nowhere to go, they stick it in these little bags and then kind of wedge it in there and keep wedging it in there, and they find the module that's the furthest away from the crew quarters because it starts smelling and decaying and doing everything else the trash does. And then they wait for either a progress module or a shuttle module uh, or they can bring it back down. So that whole system, all the life support stuff uh, that we have up there weighs about 5,000 kilograms dry. And then you say by the time you use it for a year and you bring up all those resupplied consumables, it weighs 10,000 kilograms. And a year later, it weighs 15,000 kilograms, and so on and so on. So every year, we're adding on 5,000 kilograms of mass to that life support system. Uh, we're still significantly reducing the resupplied consumables, but we're still adding mass by a large amount. So essentially the problem is we haven't severed that umbilical cord, and with this approach we never will sever that umbilical cord that keeps us within a couple of hundred miles of Earth. It's just not practical to go any further that way. So when we start thinking about these next generation missions, we go new life support systems, and it's not just new technologies, it's a whole new philosophy. We've got to get out of that consumables resupply mode get into something that looks more like regenerable systems. It's one of the most challenging and critical aspects that we have for <coughs> long duration human missions. So there's the big question. As, as we start thinking about artist renditions of either an initial outpost on Sun, it could be the moon, it could be Mars, doesn't matter. This one's red, you could do this in black and white, and say it's the moon. Uh, or if you're thinking about more sustained bases like this one where there's something underground, there's a little bit of radiation shielding or something that says a more permanent presence. <coughs> Is it possible to provide that oxygen and that water and the food that you know you need while also recovering resources from the waste products that you're otherwise generating in some kind of a system that resembles an integrated approach that's better than the hygiene that <coughs> does the Sabati, does the that thing? And the answer is yes. Uh, as it turns out, it's called a bioregenerative life support system. And this is kind of the third part where we start getting into the biology. 
It's a hybrid system. They say use those physical chemical technologies where they work best for specific functions, but try and start incorporating some biological processors for what they work best, kind of like what we use here on Earth. Okay, I know I'd get to the biology eventually. Um, you're probably all aware that plants and animals are pretty compatible and complementary in their functions, right? Uh, plants kind of convert light energy into chemical energy. We use chemical energy. They remove CO2. We produce CO2. They produce oxygen and water. We use oxygen and water. And most of what we're familiar with is they transform that carbon dioxide and hydrogen into food that we eat. So it's a good kind of working relationship there. Turns out, well, to, to do the, the other part, the mechanism of photosynthesis and the byproducts, and I'll call them waste products for right now, are very complementary to the metabolism of human metabolism or animals and our waste products. When I say wastes, that's the term that we're going to try and get away from uh, very shortly. Uh, because we say if, if, if these are waste products to a plant and we can use them, are they really wastes? And if the stuff that we call waste is useful to something else, is that really a waste or is it just something else that could be useful? As the title asks, is this a good example, plants and people, of a symbiotic or mutually parasitic relationship? What's the difference? Yes, you in the green. No? You're it. Me? Yeah. Um, I, I made sure there was no way. other green in the whole <laughs> world. I'm being mean. But, uh, okay, you can go ahead. Um, I think it's symbiotic because parasitic kind of implies that one is gaining at the loss of the other. And in this case, we're not, the plant isn't gaining, like, we're not losing one the plant using our... Yeah. In other words, somewhere in there as you go, symbiotic, mutually <laughs> parasitic. Uh, what's the difference in there? And you go, this isn't actually all that funny, especially if you've been in one of those relationships. Uh, not that I have. Uh, but it's a good example of a mutually parasitic relationship. In other words, you say it's kind of you're feeding off each other. You're, you're coexisting to the detriment of both. And the symbiotic part is where you say, well, that's actually where it's to the mutual benefit of both. Looks like you're doing the same thing, right? You're, you're still together. You're doing stuff. But one actually is beneficial, and the other, over the long haul, is not going to get you where you want to be. And that's the whole challenge for life support systems. We're really good at making mutually parasitic ones. Uh, we're not so good at the symbiotic part yet. And so this is a simplified schematic, very simplified, of a, a bioregenerative system. Uh, this isn't a new concept. This is essentially what keeps us alive on Earth here. It's a great model. Why is it a great model? Well, it's worked for a couple of hundred million years. Uh, but the version we would want for space, of course, would be much smaller. Uh, much smaller buffers in particular, for <coughs> oceans and whole atmospheres up there. So, so we really have to understand what can we learn from this kind of a system? How do we apply it to a space environment where we'll have very limited buffers? And with very limited buffers, that implies we're going to have much faster reaction times. So, so you've got to know how to control it. You have to know every aspect of this thing because you don't get, well, for example, decades or hundreds of years where we find out that, well, and, do things on Earth for 50 or 100 years, and only now are we starting to notice the pollution buildup. Uh, we won't have that option in the spacecraft environment. So it's a very good model to use. Uh, the only problem is it's not very well understood, and that's what we're trying to learn and say how can we do that. Uh, as we try and do that for space-based applications, I would put forward that we might also have some benefits right here on Earth for the same kind of knowledge, same kind of information. Uh, address some of the environmental concerns that we currently have. Uh, so it's, it's great for the space program, but you might see there's, there's some other applications as well. So what approach can we take to try and understand all of this kind of a bioregenerative system? And we pretty much have two choices. You either start from the top down, and you know, it's the big global perspective, or work from the bottom up, all the different subsystems. <laughs> How many of you have heard of Biosphere 2? A couple? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was the one that was in Arizona several years ago. They took that top-down approach, uh, what's called the systematist approach. 
And they had similar goals as NASA. They said, we want to kind of enclose a bunch of people in a, in a tightly sealed environment. Uh, has everything inside they need to live. Uh, their quote was actually a means of establishing permanent colonies, uh, whether it was for other planets or just being able to say we can live self-sufficiently here on Earth. Uh, so they took eight people, about 4,000 different species of, of plants and fish and, and everything else you can put in an ocean. They had five different uh, climate zones. They had an ocean, they had a savanna, they had a growing area, a farm kind of thing. Uh, Three million cubic feet of air. For those of us that, that get interested in that kind of stuff, yes, there is enough oxygen, three million cubic feet of air, to keep eight people alive for a year, right from the get-go. So when we talk about the big buffers, small buffers, they started with the big buffers. They said, doesn't matter what else happens in here, we have enough oxygen for these people for the whole time they're going to be in here. As long as everything else kind of balances out. Something isn't consuming it more than the rate we think it will be. And they predicted that whole thing. They put it under three acres of glass. It's a rather large system. And they said, well, it's going to reach equilibrium. Well, it did, uh, but, but not the equilibrium that would support human life for a long period of time. It was more on the green algae level of life that it would support for a long period of time. Uh, however, in fairness, you know, they learned a lot about that whole symbiotic, mutually parasitic relationship in a closed system. And it was private money. Uh, can I say that? that if, if, you know, if NASA had the kind of money they did and they invested in it, well, we'd still probably be doing it all on paper and we would have never built anything. And at least they found out that you go, this is a dang hard problem to address. Uh, so I give them a lot of credit for that. Here's the NASA approach. Not quite as sexy, not quite as glamorous. Uh, it's the bottom up, right? We're not going to do the top down big version. Uh, this is the guys in the lab who say, let's really thoroughly understand each and every aspect of this whole sequence of events. Once we do, we now say, how do we put this together to where it suits our purposes? Uh, we're a conservative agency. There's probably good reason for that. You get the life support. It's about as conservative as it gets. Uh, there's hardly anyone out there that says, sure, give it a shot. If it doesn't work, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the outcome. And it's your life you're talking about. Uh, so it's going to be a very evolutionary approach that they take here. Uh, this kind of a system, very multidisciplinary. Uh, we have industry. We have university involvement, uh, a lot of faculty. Uh, it's really trying to understand all the different aspects of it. And as I mentioned, when you're trying to think about that kind of thing, you're really changing the philosophy of what we do in life support. You're moving into that regenerative, closed system uh, sort of approach. NASA being a conservative agency, they're not going to let you do that all at once because they say we have systems that have flown, that are flight qualified, that have proven themselves out. Why do you really need something that's, that's completely different as you move to the future? So you need a gradual approach, and maybe where you're doing partial food production, maybe where you're recovering some of those resources of oxygen and water with biological processors, and you're demonstrating that it works and it's feasible, it fits in the space of our um, This is a little bit of selfless self-promotion, but it's relevant, so I get to throw it in. Uh, this is a concept that I was first hired at NASA uh, to work on. It became affectionately known as the salad machine. And the whole idea was to get that nose of the camel into the tent. Uh, it was saying, can we demonstrate on a small scale, notice it's about refrigerator size, NASA does everything in refrigerator size, uh, that you could grow plants in the space environment. Uh, it's not producing the food for the astronauts, it's augmenting the diet. You say it's, it's some fresh green stuff that you can use that, that's just you still got your food, you still have your water and your air, but it augments the diet a little bit, and if you're instrumented cleverly, and it was instrumented very cleverly, uh, you can measure how much oxygen is being produced, you can measure how much CO2 is being produced, you can measure how much water you could potentially recover that could be used by the crew if you ever got those clearances for it. And the whole idea was to say, demonstrate that first step away from complete reliance on food and some of our other life support consumables in a very small, easy package that was also kind of non-threatening to the whole NASA system. They liked it so much they killed the project, and I'm now doing other things. Uh, that's a different story. Uh, in addition to that, you know, modest nutritional benefit though, 
uh, and you say it's really you know demonstrating for the first time, there's also some other things that could come in handy with growing plants in the space of our psychological benefits. Um, how much time do I have? Getting close? Oh no, you get about 20, 25 minutes. Okay, good. I'll save some time for questions because they heard there's one or two. But uh, a while back there was a Russian mission, a solid 200 day mission, uh, and they were doing some scientific experiments. They were growing onions and a bunch of other plants uh, to see how they grew in the space environment. And you have the scientists on the ground, and I should back up, these were Soviets. Uh, the Russian part is, I, I switched a few years ago because we worked very closely with them. Uh, this was in the Soviet program. And they were reporting all the data, and at one point, the, the cosmonauts, and those cosmonauts were all military. Uh, they, they, it's not a civilian space program at that time for them. Uh, they reported that these onions and the plants that they were growing died. Uh, so the scientists on the ground kind of said, well, you know, we were hoping to get this whole plant cycle, you know, from seed and germination and growing and then flowering and then dying off. We didn't, but at least we can learn something about, you know, how do they die in space. And so they told them. And they, they kind of went through and a little bit later they said, we're quite concerned because you know, we asked, well, did the roots turn black on the tips? Did it wilt? Uh, what was the sequence of events that these plants died on orbit? And the sequence that they told them said, this doesn't match to any known series of plant physiology mechanisms that we have here on Earth. So there's something seriously changed in the space environment. That was the point when the cosmonauts said, well, they died because we ate them. <laughs> So the, the point here to keep in mind is to say these were Russian military, Soviet military cosmonauts, selected at the peak of their military careers to fly in space. And they not only elected to eat a science experiment, but lie about it, knowing they're going to get caught. <coughs> that's how strong, after 200 days in space, something that's green and tempting like this gets in terms of those psychological benefits, which are really hard to quantify. No one wants to talk about them, but they're there. Of course, the reason I think they did is because you go, this is, remember the, the thermostabilized food, right? This is dinner. This is science. <laughs> if you had a choice, which would you rather do? Eat the science or chicken sandwiches? Yeah, well, okay, enough on the food. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is, besides demonstrate that on a small scale, is we go, some of my colleagues at Kennedy Space Center, uh, they have a lot of expertise in saying, does this scale up? Uh, not just on a refrigerator side, but say actually for a group of six, for planetary basis for long duration missions. <coughs> not just the first step, but can we really start incorporating biological processors into our life support system? Do plants fit in the space environment? Do they have the same productivity, same photorespiration, all the other issues associated with plant growth? Uh, can you make the system small enough to be practical? Remember the Biosphere 2 is about three acres, and, and I don't know if you read the stories or remember, but you go, it was completely sealed, uh, was, was the claim. Uh, but yet, somehow, pizza boxes managed to slide in and out of the cracks in there, because otherwise the folks were really, really undernourished. Uh, so their three acres didn't work for, for the eight people they had. Uh, the NASA research that we've had uh, has reduced the caloric requirements. Now this isn't a balanced diet, eating, you know, complete metabolism. But just for the calories, 2,500 calories average that you need per person per day. Uh, they've reduced that from about two acres, which is out in the field, uh, which is the best yields, best productivity that we get in, in farm agriculture kind of systems down to about 20 square meters uh, that's grown in these kind of systems hydroponically in chambers. So you go a remarkable reduction in, in the footprint and the size that's needed. This is actually the point where you go, yeah, it's feasible to fit in the space environment. Now what you have to do is change the mindset a little bit. So those are some of the, the main things we're doing for NASA. And then we go, well, okay, so what who cares besides keeping the astronauts alive? Well, there's some good things that can come out of it that might apply here on Earth. And we go, well, you, you can see them. Better water reclamation techniques, better water processors, contamination control methods, better waste management technologies for sure, dealing with all the trash and waste parts, 
uh, improved crop productivity, major advances and gains there, better recycling techniques, and, and also a lot of that carbon credit green building thing that everyone's really jumping on the bandwagon for in the last year or so. Uh, when you start thinking about it, you say, how do we reduce our footprint? How do we become more carbon neutral? Uh, how do we regenerate everything? And you say, this is essentially what we have been trying to do, and this is the <coughs> distinction here in the <coughs> space program, and you say, recycling, is, you can take a bottle, for example, and wash it and use it over and over and over as a bottle, right? That's recycling. But regenerating is taking waste products. It's taking stuff you wouldn't otherwise use and turning it back into something useful. And that's what the life support program is trying to do, is they take those unusable products, convert them back into something useful. So in conclusion, uh, we live in a world with limited resources. And for the moon, it's, it's that one. Uh, it's the only one so far that we know that supports life. It has an increasing population, uh, a decline in the amount of arable land we have, uh, landfills that are growing <coughs> uh, I don't know if you've been reading about the, the creative solutions in Naples and in Europe where they're, they're just flat out running out of space. Uh, we have to find new ways of utilizing those resources more efficiently, uh, of producing more food in less space, and with a lot less non-recyclable waste. Those are exactly the issues that we're addressing in developing these advanced life support systems that we need for these future missions, the long duration ones far away from home where you don't have that option of dumping it or using it all up and coming home before you run out. Uh, so as we kind of develop those next generation systems that will hopefully allow humans to, to go much beyond low Earth orbit, uh, perhaps even planetary bases at some point in the future, uh, to where we're truly inhabiting space, not just visiting it like we're currently doing. Uh, I think that maybe one of the most important benefits that we'll realize out of that is a much better understanding, awareness, and hopefully sensitivity of our, our own home planet. So with that, I will take questions. I'm going to start off. <coughs> Something struck me having heard this like before. When they're packaging all the food and so on, why don't they use something like cellulose, or something besides plastic? Like biodegradable. Biodegradable kind of could be used to, um, in terms of you know for growing plants, mulching, or whatever. Shelf life. Um, as you would imagine, you say any package that degrades means well whatever's inside of it at some point is going to be exposed to the elements, and it's 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 not a very good reason, frankly. Is NASA has its standard, and they say for us in current packaging and shelf life, all of that thermal stabilized food, which is adopted from other programs, we won't mention the military ones, um, <coughs> it's a five year shelf life. So that's the requirement. You say, are we doing any missions that last five years? No. Is it likely it's sitting around on the ground for five years and in a warehouse, and that's the only food we have for them? No. <coughs> But the requirement is it has to have five-year shelf life, and there's no biodegradable materials for packaging that have that kind of a shelf life yet. Even though we say we could use a much shorter shelf life just fine. And this is why the cosmic has bring up <laughs> Other questions? I know there are lots of lots of questions. Go ahead. Um, they have some kind of experiment where they they put someone how many people in a big room that they have. Kind of doing a semi enclosed environment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, those, those are some of my colleagues, uh, although we have to do the prior ones. Um, but what, what that project was, they had a plant growth chamber. They have vacuum chambers in Houston. Uh, everything's big in Texas, if, if you don't know that already. Uh, so they have big vacuum chambers, and then they sit around, well, after the Apollo program, largely empty because they use them to test all of their hardware and equipment that was going to the moon. Uh, so they took one of those vacuum chambers and said we could grow plants in it, wheat. And they said that would be producing carbon dioxide and, and or oxygen, <coughs> removing some of the CO2, and some water production, kind of like that salad machine. And then they had another chamber that they said, well, here is our people and all of our traditional physical chemical life support technologies, all those kind of things that, that you saw that do the air and the water loops. 
And the idea in this experiment was to say, use the physical chemical technologies, but have the second chamber, the one that's growing wheat, hooked up by a pipe or a series of pipes. And say, so be able to measure how much oxygen is produced, how much CO2 is reduced. Because they had humans in the loop, this was a human-rated test. Uh, there's, there's health issues, safety issues, medical issues that they said, we can't just feed this air and this water that's recovered from the plant chamber directly to the humans, but we can measure it. And we have the ability through these pipes to introduce it back into here. They just kind of bent it off to the side. But it was an, another step along the way is saying, can we really demonstrate this works that's feasible? Uh, and that was a 91-day study. Uh, so it was very successful. Uh, unfortunately, we've kind of been directed to focus on, on more immediate near-term issues right now. So a lot of that kind of the, the biological part is, is a little bit on the back burner. Uh, but I think in the next administration, uh, where there's a little bit more, I would say, the scientific curiosity, um, it may come back. To save embarrassment, I know there was a question from Al about using facilities, like using, how, uh, using the bathroom in space, basically. How do you go to the bathroom in space? Yes. One leg at a time. No, wait, that's how you get dressed. Um, okay. Um, what do you imagine would be the problem with going to use the facilities in space? No gravity. No gravity. What's the problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Quick, quick story. So we have one minute left. No, um, no, you get you get six minutes left. Six minutes left. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Everything kind of goes everywhere, and you go. Well, the liquid part, you can kind of see your way through the urine as you go. All right. Some series of funnels and sponges and tubes and, and suction devices, and people get a little squeamish, but you go. It's doable. But you go. The real issue is solid waste, and you go in the Apollo program, and I should have brought the slide. Um, in the Apollo program, they just had plastic bags, long, narrow plastic bag. Um, they have this guy, I mean, this was 60s, um, he's in plaid pants and he's demonstrating how you attach this plastic bag to himself. Plaid pants were worth it just for that long. Uh, they were green and orange. Um, and they said it, it worked, again, that practical, successful part, lightweight. Um, however, the big problem with it is they said gravity is absent, so these waste products are not getting pulled away from your body. So there was kind of this manual step in there with this plastic bag, <laughs> you can use your imaginations, right, uh, that they really, really weren't into. So they said, can you improve that? Well, yes, of course we can. We're, we're NASA. Uh, so we come up with essentially artificial gravity, convection. We get a big airflow stream that says we can put enough air around this system that we can pull the waste away from the body. That's the EDO toilet that we have on the shelf in the station and everything else. Well, this is now a, a unit, you know, about the size of this corner over here. It's big, it's heavy, it uses a lot of power. And then along comes the next vehicle, this crew exploration vehicle that looks a lot more like the Apollo module than the space shuttle. Where does that toilet fit? Uh, they, they literally, because it's overweight, uh, it's a very small space capsule, they said, well, we've got a problem now. We want to put six crew members in this thing because that's where we're eventually heading for moon missions. But we have a choice. We can have five people in a toilet, or we can have six people in no toilet. Do you think there were any volunteers in the astronaut office to say, I want to be the equivalent of a toilet? <laughs> so we got a real problem. And, and the issue is now, how do we make that toilet smaller, maintain the functions of, of that airflow entrainment that pulls waste away from the body, for both liquids and solids, but it's a lot lighter, a lot smaller, a lot more friendly. Uh, and you thought the 1.6 gallon flush per minute was a challenge. So we are developing one, and it actually it works fairly well, and it doesn't even cost $20 million. Is that, is that going on at Johnson? Or no, that's, that's at Ames here. At Ames? We could have a toilet person in <laughs> Thursday. Yeah. Well, the, the main idea is you say there's, there's enough improvements in materials, and we're kind of borrowing off of that camping thing. Membrane-based systems, kind of like Gore-Tex, things that let gases through but not liquids, or things that let liquids through but not solids. You can put enough layers of those together in a very light, simple system that says we get the liquids where we want them, we get the solids where we want them, 
and we can still get enough airflow through there to where we get rid of odors, we can do the entrainment part, and it's not as big as a brick. No, I can't say that here. Uh, well, some kind of a large system. Yes, sir? How abundant is the electricity supply from the solar panels at the space station? Like, you have the electrolysis that they do. Yeah. Do you, is the, you know, supply electricity to that an issue, or? It is not that abundant. Uh, to give you an idea, the CO2 removal system that we have on orbit on station, single largest power consumer of any system up there, and it's about a kilowatt on average. Now a kilowatt is, is kind of the wimpy burner on your electric stove. It's the small one, it's not the big one. Uh, that's how big a deal power is there. They go one kilowatt running continuously pretty well kills a whole bunch of other things that we need power for. So that's another major thing that we go for long duration missions. You say we have to find new ways of producing power uh, or improving either the solar or, or alternative power systems like that. Sorry, What's the, I'm good. Just, like, what is the efficiency of the solar like, panels that they're using? There have been some huge improvements. I, I don't know for sure uh, You know the exact numbers I can get that for you. But the big problem is when we think about planetary surfaces is they degrade over time, dust. As you go, you know, whether it's Mars or the Moon or anything else, as you go, what they started at could be 98% efficient, but in very short order, they're going to be a lot less than that. So they have to oversize the whole thing to plan on about a 60% operating efficiency. I don't know what the, the top peak numbers are, though. Again, with the Chai class, I'll go ahead and ask you the related questions of Sex in space and privacy. Is there such a thing as privacy? Yes. Mal Cohen is going to tell you all about now, sex he already, in space. And he, we've already, he's come and gone. Who's You're lecture? stuck. Chris. Well, Chris actually, McKay maybe he's going to tell you. He's a veteran friend. Is there any privacy? Is there? Have they thought about any of this? Yeah. Um. I know they were talking about having married couples. There are all sorts of issues. The best way it gets, it gets described to me, and, and I, I have to be a little careful because I, I have a, a number of colleagues in the astronaut office, and I would like to continue to have a number of colleagues in the astronaut office because that's where we get all our information. Uh, as you would imagine when you say, is there going to be any problem that's life-threatening that if you can solve it, anyone's going to acknowledge on orbit? No. Uh, so all of these issues kind of come down by word of mouth where you go, we need to fix this, we need to fix that, what can you do about this area? Unless you have the guys who are flying that feel comfortable with sharing that information, you don't know what to fix. They're going to say, everything's fine, because there are only two people on the planet that keep them from flying. That's the flight surgeon and the psych, uh, the, the, the uh, psychologist, sorry. <laughs> uh, so they're not going to acknowledge anything that's an issue that says one of those two guys go, there might be a medical basis for you not doing that. Uh, so for, for the privacy part, the best way to think about it is they say privacy isn't something you always build in or design, it's something you give people. And for those of you that have lived in other countries, uh, maybe you've ridden the metro systems in Japan or Europe, you notice that you go, that there, there's not a whole bunch of, of in-your-face, <coughs> no one designs in little private booths on, on the metro there. It's something you give other people by your actions and what you do. And I say very lightly for the kinds of constraints of the volume that we're in, as you go, that's kind of going to be the way it's going to have to work. Any other questions? This is your big chance. So I have <coughs> another question, maybe embarrassing question, Jane. Um, how does menstruation work in space? I have to, I look like I <laughs> <laughs> a question. Mal said you did. <laughs> Chris McKay is actually the NASA oh, reigning expert on it. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good question, but I do not know. We can get uh, you the answer, though. I do know. We're that joking we around. We can get someone like Mal or Emily would know. Yeah. There, there's a lot of female astronauts. Uh, I know particularly on the Russian side that have been up there for a lot longer than 120 days. So there is data. I just don't know what it is. Yes. So, uh, isn't the like deadline to go to Mars relatively soon? What's like the current plan for the system? If the 
timeline you said is like the style of the timeline. That's like the mission timeline. What is the kind of current proposed plan? <coughs> Current plans, uh, and I'll emphasize current as you go, they want this new vehicle, this crew exploration vehicle, first unmanned tests in 2012, so really soon, a couple of three years away. Manned version is 2014, and I say that's kind of the version that we go, we're going to get experience with it replacing the shuttle, but variations on that would be what are intended for these longer duration missions. Now, you know, so they go with the idea of going back to the moon 2020 and, and beyond after that. Uh, here's where I'm going to be politically incorrect again. Uh, that whole system was based on our current administration's policy called the Vision for Space Exploration. Uh, however, this vision didn't come with any additional budget. And, and call me old-fashioned, but a vision without budget is more of a hallucination than a real vision. Uh, you can wish for it and dream it and imagine it, but it, it's nothing's making it real. So almost certainly that date's going to slip pretty far out. New administration comes in, and you go. They'll probably re-examine it, retailor it, and, and say, "Well, what's our take and what's on?" Uh, so my guess is, you go the, the early part. Of this next vehicle will be ready in the 2012-2014 time frame, but the next generation of it applications for these long-duration missions will probably slip quite a bit to the right. All right. Well, I think we should certainly thank. Dr. Cliss, for going well beyond the call of duty. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.